The surface temperature record goes back to the late 1800s, but is far from clean. The number of stations has declined significantly over the years, and the quality is often questionable. Many stations are polluted by the local environment, for example, near runway tarmacs, or as we can see here, next to a trash burn barrel. In addition, many sites, which were unspoilt and greenfield a hundred years ago, are now built up and within cities. Buildings retain heat and artificially raise the local temperature beyond natural background levels. This urban heat island effect has been declared negligible by the IPCC. But many others claim it has exaggerated official temperatures by as much as 20%. The urban heat island effect is very well documented and suggests that there is an exaggeration in the global temperature record. But the IPCC choose to ignore this. After all, it does prop up global warming theory. With that said, even if the record is inflated by 20%, there still is global warming. That is not being questioned here. What is questioned, though, is that it is not as large as they say, and it's been rising for 300 years, well before industrialization. So, it is likely that global warming is largely due to natural variation and very little to do with CO2 production. All the, records the beauty of science is that it's rarely black and white. It's often shades of grey, and we end up believing a theory because the weight of probability agrees with it. So let's look at some of the claims of man-made CO2 being the primary driver of the current global warming. It is true that CO2 correlates quite well to temperature, but it lags by 800 years, which would suggest that it is effect rather than cause. Some say this lag is irrelevant because it's the positive feedback on the temperature that makes it a global forcing. This also may be true but there is very little physical evidence to this effect. An important telltale sign of greenhouse gas-driven global warming was the expectation of hotspots in the tropical troposphere. However, over the past 25 years, they haven't been convincingly observed. We are allegedly set on a course for catastrophic global warming. This assumes that the last 50 years were the warmest in the last 1300, and is not within natural variability. However, as we've seen, not only are we not in the 50 warmest years, but also our current warming trend is remarkable in its unremarkableness. It fits easily within natural variability. Climate models, derived from historic data and assumptions on physical behaviors, claim to predict catastrophic global warming. However, their backtesting track record is questionable. Their positive feedback mechanism requires a warming in the last century of 1.4 degrees, but only 0.6 degrees was actually observed. In addition, their predictions thus far have missed the mark. They predicted continuous global warming when the last 10 years actually cooled. Considering this, can we say CO2 is the main driver of global warming? Well, yes. Never say never. But the chances do seem a tad slim. The evidence is thin on the ground. Some organizations, such as the influential IPCC, would say that the issue is done dusted all over Red Rover. CO2 is driving global warming. The science is settled. People who believe that human beings are not responsible, they would at some stage become part of history like the Flat Earth Society. Others, like the 700 top scientists who put their names on the dotted line and signed a US Senate minority report saying they were skeptical, would perhaps of course disagree. So, for argument's sake, let's assume both parties do exist, the science is thus not settled and there is no consensus. Even if all the science is phony, won't the collateral environmental benefits that emissions limiting legislation creates be an overall benefit for us anyway? So forget the science. What are the good, the bad and the ugly ramifications of climate change for us? What are the social, political and economic costs? 
Will climate change legislation make our lives better? President Obama successfully got his emissions trading scheme through the House of Representatives with the rallying cry, remember these four words, jobs, 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 and jobs. That could create millions of new jobs in America, jobs that can't be shipped overseas. Previously in 2007, he did also state his other main motive, will reduce our dependence on foreign oil. President Obama's second point regarding energy security, which harkens back to Maggie Thatcher's original motive when she set the wheels in motion for the inauguration of the IPCC, is very sensible. The miners resisted and the police moved forward en masse in a maneuver well tried and tested. During the struggles which followed, one policeman was hit on the head by a stone. Energy security is very important. In addition, fossil fuels are finite. Burning them for energy instead of using them in manufacturing does seem a waste if it were avoidable. But is the net effect of climate change legislation a benefit to mankind? Is it really a great opportunity to create jobs? Well, whether you believe that CO2 is destroying our planet or not, why don't we do the sensible thing and minimize the risk? Isn't it better to be safe than sorry? True, this precautionary principle as it is called is often a prudent way to go about things. However, what if the cost of the precaution actually outweighs the risk? And in addition, what if this cost is not only prohibitively large, but also virtually ineffective anyway? Similarly, why would you buy a car, then pay an insurance premium on it that is greater than the car's actual worth? To top it off, this overpriced premium would only cover the replacement of a wing mirror when you accidentally total the whole car. In many ways, bizarrely, both sides of the argument admit to this. In Australia, for example, both the Conservative parties and the Greens are in an unusual agreement. Both say no to the emissions trading scheme. The Conservatives believe that the scheme will, especially mid credit crunch, cripple the economy with only very minor results in CO2 reductions. For that very same reason, the Greens won't vote for a scheme with only very minor reductions. As they say, this is not enough. G'day Australia, here's what's happening. Kevin Rudd wants us to pass a bill which sets targets way too low to stop climate change. He's locking in failure. He wants you to believe that the only choice is between his bill and no bill at all. That's bunkum. It's only the socialists in the middle who are voting for the feel-good, but rather damaging and somewhat ineffective scheme. So what are the costs of CO2 reduction? The important campaign slogan for President Obama to pass the US emissions scheme is green jobs. This scheme will come in the popular cap and trade guise. This means cap overall CO2 emissions, then trade excess quotas to the highest bidder. Thus, the inefficient companies essentially subsidize the efficient. This may sound all well and good in theory, but what are the emission schemes? They're taxes, plain and simple. We're not talking about a small, marginal tax. The US, among other developed countries, is proposing the largest tax in its history, greater than that to fund World War II. That's 300 billion US a year. President Obama has been trying to promote the green jobs benefit and downplaying the associated cost, as he says himself. Under my plan uh, of a cap and trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. We in the West can hardly afford this. However, in the developing countries, this is simply out of the question. Without cheap energy, they can't fight their way out of poverty. The EU have had an emissions scheme running since 2005, and it has had its fair share of criticism. Studies say for that every green job created in Spain, for example, 2.2 are lost, and each of these jobs costed 1 million to create. Because in Spain what the politicians have done is to create a renewable bubble and every year in order to maintain the bubble there they have to put more and more millions or more billions uh, into the bubble. Jobs created out of taxes are generally jobs not worth having. They are inefficient and often unnecessary. There was a very good reason the 100% employment policy of communism led to ultimate economic collapse. It doesn't work. You can't make something out of nothing. And Spain's unemployment rate is currently the highest in Europe. To really minimize emissions and improve 